So, uh, Dev versus Ops. This is a uh, uh, talk that we've uh, hastily put together. So, these are all of our opinions, I'm afraid, and we will caveat them heavily. But there's a lot of DevOps message out there. There's a lot of people talking about DevOps. There's a lot of people talking about what it really means. But there's the application to you beyond the tools and the technology is often missing. So, we hope to give you a walkthrough about what we've seen in the wild when we've been out working with our customers and when we've been implementing it ourselves, and hopefully make a bit more sense of this blob, this cloud of stuff that means, well, practically nothing. Well, if we start with who we are, hi, I'm Dan, I'm Dan Hardiker, I'm one of the organizers of DevOps, and amongst other things, I'm a chief evangelist at Adaptivist. I'm also a CTO mentor and a DevOps consultant, uh, but my core of being is I'm a thoroughbred developer, and I still like to hack and cut code. This is. I'm Henry. Um, I've uh, I've had the <coughs> dubious pleasure of working with Dan for many years, and uh, he's wrote me in today because uh, I have an ops background. So I used to be a sysadmin. I've recovered now, but uh, um, I, I do have that in my past. <laughs> So we're going to take on a few roles. Um, one of my roles is going to be the dodgy developer, the stereotypical guy who doesn't care about anything other than being the unicorn developer that comes in and saves the day. Henry, on the other hand. Well, I'm Boff H, of course. Um, I know that I get woken up in the middle of the night by the server, and uh, I'll kill the alert system, because that was the problem, right? <laughs> So you see these stereotypes in organizations, and perhaps not to the comical degree we might take them, but you'll see large chunks of truth, and it's assault that you're really wanting to take from this. So as a disclaimer, I'd like to point out that all of our opinions are our own, and we are focusing on the scope of DevOps. So there's a lot more to culture than what we're going to be discussing, as well as to the implementation and how teams function. But the majority of what we'll be talking about is subjective, and it's our views. And uh, we've deliberately made some mistakes in this presentation, perhaps one of them being even presenting today. But first, let's cover the agenda for what we're going to try and cover in the next 50 minutes or so. Hopefully you'll find some of it at least as interesting as we do. But I'm sure that everyone in the audience knows what DevOps is. But as we might have n people in the audience, we'll have n plus one opinions about what DevOps really means to them and how you go about applying it. So we'll then take you on a whistle-stop tour of some of these opinions and the most common ones we've heard in the wild. But the really interesting thing is where they miss, because while we've, while we've noticed some themes around where DevOps is being used as an excuse to do the wrong thing, we've also seen some cases where it's willfully abused as an excuse to do uh, something for their own ends. And across the board, we've also noticed a number of emerging trends, which we'll share. And then we're going to finally paint a picture of what good looks like. And this isn't necessarily the same for the different types of organizations out there. But ultimately, all that really matters is how this applies to your organizations and what you can do to get there. So the term DevOps, um, we thought we'd quickly introduce where does this term come from? Uh, what's in this word? Um, so DevOps is an evolution of concepts. It's been talked about in Agile conferences since about the mid-noughties. Uh, it was born out of the Agile manifesto, lean methodologies. In fact, uh, you can see around 2012, IBM and uh, CA have their De DevOps toolkits. And HP even called a suite H uh, ALM, as if tooling is all you need for it. Uh, Gene Kim released his fantastic book, The Phoenix Project, um, which draws parallels with manufacturing and uh, builds on the works of the goal, the theory of constraints, and the Toyota production system. And DevOps has really um, formed a life of its own now. I think it's distinct from Agile and the Agile conferences, and so it has its own uh, momentum. Um, we looked on... Google Trends and looking for DevOps as a search term. And Google recognizes it starts around 2010, and it's pretty much been growing exponentially since. So it's obvious that DevOps is not a fad, uh, so it's something worth understanding. Um, Given, given its popularity, we wondered what the people were actually looking for, beyond the terms itself. I mean, it's all right and well seen that the terms are being searched for, but what are the people themselves behind it looking for? 
I found it really interesting that the majority of people seem to be confused and need a clarity of definition about what this is. We can't comment on the noise out there, but there's certainly a lot of signals. But surprisingly, as much as there is unity around the notion that DevOps is not a role, it seems that the recruitment industry didn't get that memo. Next, we're wanting to know uh, what tools are, can be used for DevOps. It's almost as if there's a desire to be able to install DevOps, but we all know that's not actually possible. We particularly love that the fourth item on the list is DevOps reactions. Uh, has anyone seen DevOps reactions? For those that haven't and uh, aren't accustomed, uh, here are a few gems. I mean, watch out, because like fail blogs and pictures of kittens, these can consume a large amount of your time. But uh, so this is mandated during most operational awareness courses. Uh, I believe this is the standard and endorsed by ITIL uh, for deployment. Yeah, brace for impact. If uh, you're doing prototyping, we want to build mocks to prove the concepts. Uh, and sometimes this isn't wholly appreciated by the customer and business users we test them against. This can lead to some confusion and uh, some amusement, but ultimately it's all about the management of expectations. So the moment when our dark lords from security join us, we're obviously not implying, by the way, that they do some sort of voodoo, but no one ever can seem to fully understand the arcane laws that they seem to govern us with. It's certainly a rite of passage sitting through your first debrief after a vulnerability has been exploited, and I'd rather not be in your shoes if it was your, microso your microservice that leaked the Addison Lee data. But we've seen many software development cycles and depict the journey in this way. However, this may actually be the most accurate we've seen in some time. Note the successful delivery with only the passenger's vehicle, the uh, vehicle's passengers and the bridge architects truly aware of the horrors that were experienced along the way. But hey, it works. It did. completed. It, successful delivery, what's the problem, right? <laughs> so, of course, there has been some de um, development and operations teams within organizations for some time. And it's worth having a look as to what organizations have at the moment. I mean, we'll talk later about different organizational types, but most organizations and people here don't have a choice over starting these teams and building them together. So what do we have at the moment and where have they come from? In fact, these teams are often the most established within the organizations. From the view of both camps, it's worth taking just a minute to review the journey so far and the technologies that have emerged and the trend towards what we're now calling DevOps. So, in de uh, development, we've seen uh, improvements around source control from subversion to, through to Git. We've seen continuous integration take hold, and we've grasped that with both hands. We're not building on our desktops anymore and using sacred images. The artifact management, we've now got somewhere to put the stuff that we're building, and from that, we can then do continuous delivery. And all of that can be underpinned by better specifications through behavior-driven development. I mean, we've done a wonderful amount of stuff all inside of development. But what has operations done? Well, while you've been working on that, ops have been improving uh, also. Um, in the beginning, there was network booting that enabled us to create server templates, and the sysadmin saw that it was good. SSH came along and removed the insecurities of Telnet and our login and provided us basically a secure transport so that you can start uh, automating without fear. Um, obviously, along with clever port forwarding, connection multiplexing, all that kind of stuff. Possibly more exciting, machine virtualization has come along and it's really matured and it gives us greater density in our data centers and uh, again gives us greater programmability of our infrastructure, Think, things like VMware and OpenStack. And continuing with that journey, you've got containers, uh, I think C groups and Docker. Um, and then last but not least, you've got configuration management tools, um, Puppet, Chef, Ansible, name your favorite. Um, have extended what we used to do with server templating to now make it completely programmatic and able to be changed as well after the fact that you've created it. So it's, it's interesting just taking a look to see how isolated those development paths have been. But it doesn't mean that innovation and progression haven't been made on both sides. But if we look at the field we call DevOps, as we start to pull this innovation team together in a single unit group, you can see the, the sorts of things that we've managed to achieve. I mean, DevOps and uh, Dev and Ops have independently evolved their tooling, and the trend on both sides has been to make things more programmable. But the increasing overlap in purpose between the, the, the 
application. If attendees could make their way to the sessions, please, that would be much appreciated. We're closing the exhibit hall. Thank you. <laughs> I guess you're here. <laughs> so I'll carry on. <laughs> Uh, but more recently, the Devon Ops team have been working together on, the t on their tooling with this converging. It's having some really powerful outcomes. I mean, cloud infrastructure, infrastructure as a service and platform as a service, self-healing and auto-scaling. So, so these aren't things that we could have done on our own. Coming together has been really, really powerful. But one thing is clear. While we don't agree on what a definition of DevOps is, let's take a look at some of the statements that have been made. So it's the coming together of dev and ops teams, working together, bringing the role of operations into the scope of product management. That seems reasonable to me. Oh, I'm not so sure. I think really it's uh, infrastructure as code. It's what we used to call scripting. It's make the development and production environments the same. Well, you could say that, but isn't it actually more about the reduction of friction? It's about the reducing that in the development process through automation so that we can achieve continuous delivery. Sort of, but, but it's also the shared responsibility and ownership for things that go into production. I mean, it worked fine in dev. It's an ops problem now. I don't see a problem. <laughs> but no, it's more about the application of development principles uh, the, to operations. It's things like separation of concerns. The repeatability, testability, everyone wants these things, right? Yeah, and I've seen your dev servers. Yeah. <laughs> so these abstract definitions are, are, are all well and good, but in fact, most of them aren't mutually exclusive. But instead, let's take a look at some more concrete definitions of what DevOps actually is in practice. Well, it could be a new job for a system administrator. <laughs> and maybe a way to get a pay rise. Uh, yeah, or one person, two jobs, which uh, is what HR would prefer, right? Uh, well, um, actually, maybe it's the Netflix and the Chaos Monkey. I mean, it encourages it all to test in production. What could possibly go wrong? I thought you created enough bugs. Uh, yeah, stupid monkey. Um, well, it's a chance for you to do your job properly, really. I mean, stack traces in log files don't really work. Um, we should just stick you all on call. Well, you could, but that's, that's not working together, really, isn't it? It's more like passing the buck. It, well, isn't it more like this? Automating everything. So if the test passed, sure, I'll get right on that for you, sir. Ensure your failures are rapid, repeatable, and robustly destructive. I mean, what could possibly go wrong? All at the click of a button. Or is it more like this? And I see this so often that it's a set of puzzle pieces. We have bits and pieces all over the place with people in their domains, and yet they're all solving their own problems. There's no integration. These aren't, this isn't a unified picture that people have cut up and we're all working towards. We're all building our own jigsaw puzzles. And so no wonder this stuff feels odd when we try and use it together. So there's been a series of emerging trends that we're seeing across the industry uh, in pursuit of DevOps. Well, if we look at what we would traditionally call services, just take any website you like, Facebook, LinkedIn, Just Eat, even selling books online is now considered a product. This has unified the creation and management processes that govern these things. But the change is subtle, but the impact is so profound. Everything is now a product. But as much as everything's a product, everything's being delivered as a service. I mean, you know, again, go back to your software as a service, platform as a service, infrastructure service, everything's a service. So pretty much all our supporting dependencies, infrastructure environments, our frameworks, are all operated and consumed as services. So whilst everything... <laughs> Is a, uh, is a product, it's all delivered as a service. And the consistency of this approach is achieved as a side effect of implementing DevOps. So if we've seen further, it's because we've stood on the shoulder of services. The logical conclusion of everything being a service is that we now compose our services out of other services. Not that sim they're similar to using frameworks and using other dependencies to build our, our software and go further faster. This does provide an integration challenge, though, as we break down our monolith into our constituent parts. In that everything is a service world, 
Whilst we are standing on the shoulders of giants, we are in effect outsourcing our requirements and risks to those providers. Uh, this gives rise to concepts which, uh, they sound uh, intuitively great, uh, serverless, no ops, but you've got to remember that it's actually, it's not no, no servers, no ops, it's somebody else's servers, it's somebody else's ops. It basically, we're getting back to outsourcing, and we've all got horror stories about outsourced and disconnected uh, support and development teams. So the hype appears to be masking some of the lessons we've learned. We used to also worry about vendor lock-in when it came to the big software vendors. But when it comes to the big service vendors, we seem to be less concerned about API lock-in. I mean, how easy would it be for you to move between service providers? Uh, think of Amazon or Azure or Google or Heroku or any other dependency you've introduced. It, it's not a new problem. In fact, it's a really old problem, but it's one that we should accept that we've only refactored our reliance on others. We've not substantially altered it. And what are your SLAs with organizations like Google, Amazon? What can you do if something goes wrong? What do you do if one of these new startups goes bust and you're no longer getting data from them? Uh, how resilient is your system to failure? I mean, the stuff that's in your control is stuff that you feel most confident about. Yet more and more, as uh, architects, we're outsourcing all of our control to others and not necessarily outsourcing the, uh, the ownership of that to them. And uh, we, we can end up in some serious trouble. With the fall of the Church of Agile and the majority of teams around the world being familiar with the underlying principles of the Agile Manifesto, albeit often constrained by the implementations of Scrum and Kanban, Agile is being revisited with the, in the context of the DevOps agenda. This is all supported through the Lean approach. Uh, the introduction of Lean um, manufacturing as a process of continual improvement of the system um, rather than any given component has led to a more holistic view being taken by teams across an organization. This approach exposes the competing aims and objectives of various teams within the system, as well as highlighting the disconnect between internal teams and those outsourced. It's not just about communication teamwork, it's also about how the teams are measured and rewarded. This perspective allows for goal alignment across the system as a whole, rather than just optimizing any team in particular. In the revisiting of Agile, we've expanded the scope of skills that are drawn into the teams, now including operations, security, and as much of the business roles as is reasonably possible. We have more and more external subject matter experts being pulled in, our UI team to psychologists coming in, for example. So CALM is a forced acronym that describes the pillar and key tenets of DevOps. In the DevOps messaging at large, how many people have actually heard of CALM or CALMS? That resonated well, didn't okay, it? Yeah. <laughs> but uh, it, Patrick Dubois and a, a bunch of other people are starting to talk about this as a acronym that describes the pillars of what DevOps is supposed to be. And so we'll start there as we have. Yes, uh, it's all about the people. Um, social, structure, communication, and collaboration. So the C is for culture. The A stands for automation. This is the optimization of the actual work being done. The making the components within the system more efficient and effective through automation. This is about working smarter, not harder. And then the L is for lean, the optimization of the system as a whole, making the workflow through the system more efficient and effective. Automation gets you fast, but lean gets you faster. This isn't really about metrics and code. This is about metrics and the processes which feed into the lean manufacturing process. As engineers, we're used to being data-driven. This is more about being data-led. So it's all very well to take DevOps and decompose it into yet another acronym, but the, the importance of CALM is how the different aspects of the system interact, and that we're viewing the processes as a dynamic system, not just a single static point in time. So we thought a, an analogy was helpful for this to show how they interact. If you consider the development process like a road network, um, you can think of automation uh, within the technology of cars themselves. And you've seen loads of automation examples all the way through to self-driving cars, but self-parking cars, 
and all about the rest of that. Culture is about how people drive on the road. Uh, do you go down the motorway as a middle lane hog? Do you, do you share your information about knowing where the latest traffic camera is uh, as a point of interest with your sat-nav? Metrics are the data taken from the traffic cameras, the road sensors, the traffic counters, and they feed into how other aspects work. And that's how this is optimized is through lean. Lean is the optimization of the overall traffic flow. So think traffic light sequencing or the type of junctions used or managed motorways. So remember, <laughs> DevOps doesn't do everything for you. It's not a replacement for product management for architecture, for implementation? It's more of a guidance, not a specification, if you think of it as a compass rather than as a sat-nav. And that makes it much easier to implement. But the first question you probably want to ask is, is this relevant to me at all? Why should I care? Well, Gartner thinks you should. As by 2016, now, uh, DevOps will evolve from being a niche strategy employed by large cloud providers to a mainstream strategy employed by 25% of global 2,000 organizations. So one of the main challenges about talking about DevOps, as I mentioned earlier, as broadly as we must, is that when it comes to applying the principles to any given organization, the variance in suitability and the best practices to how you would go about it is substantial. In order to provide advice that is practically applicable, we've distilled the organizations down to three stereotypes so that we can demonstrate what good should look like for each. So the first one being the startup. These are typically greenfield organizations. They bring no baggage, no culture, no code, no users, actually. They're usually small and may exist out in the wild. They could be a skunk works inside of a larger organization, or perhaps they're currently within a, an incubator or an accelerator program. There's the unicorn. These are the modern enterprises uh, or, uh, and uh, organizations who are at home with delivering SaaS platforms. They've risen to both scale and popularity in the past couple of decades. The startup mentality within these still remains, although their scale affects their culture, and their agile practices are also better developed. The megalith. These are the traditional enterprise organizations that have well-established cultures and practices. Conservative, risk-averse behavior is commonplace, and they have everything to lose by changing. However, standing still is not an option, as their competitors address the market with creative solutions. For these, DevOps has so much to offer, but a changing culture has to be evolutionary before it can become revolutionary. And we see the most resistance coming from these sorts of organizations from so many angles. And people trying to implement DevOps get defeated so quickly. The DevOps message has taken hold in the early adopters of the startups and the unicorns. And now the majority are showing interest at an executive level, but a proven path hasn't yet been established. So if we take a consultative look at the problem for a moment, what we need to do is we need to map out the problem domain in order to better understand... Uh, um, <laughs> uh, we need to understand the, the areas of interest. Um, these will allow us to produce, uh, if we wanted to take it to its logical conclusion, a maturity uh, matrix. And you could then judge uh, the maturity of an organization against each one of these areas. Um, the first area that we've decomposed this down into is people. And people is made up of roles and the skill sets that are required. And this will vary between organizations based on their size and the product. We've got the team structure that the roles are then mapped onto within an organization. And they may or may not align with the product. Then there's the accountability, the feeling of ownership that's uh, experienced within the teams. Uh, you may also see outsourcing within certain teams, and that brings with it its own challenges. And then you have the methodologies in use, uh, be it everything from, uh, as we've said, about Agile, Scrum, Kanban, but also ITIL and ISO standards and uh, different coding standards as well. And last but by no means least, the culture. It's the attitudes and approaches to knowledge sharing and collaboration. And this is really the key point in, across all of the organizations. The, the culture is really key to underpinning it all, isn't it? It is. So next up, we have deployment. Uh, we need to consider the scale, um, be that the size of data, the users, the um, features that are in use inside the product. 
Um, we have the performance of the product in terms of responsiveness or throughput, how robust, resilient our service has to be. And given that everything does break, it does go down, we have to consider recovery as well. And then we also want to ensure the quality of our testing. And then finally, we have risk. It, it, shouldn't think of it risk really as being a negative thing. All, uh, all organizations carry risk. But we need to think about how much and in which areas. So there's security, there's compliance and regulation, there's business continuity, and there's change control. The, this grid maps out all the interest areas that we've just highlighted. And as we come back to them, we'll highlight which areas we're really talking about. We'll use this to define what a reasonable implementation of DevOps principles looks like for the various organizational types. Uh, please note this is a positive look at what you can achieve and what you should be aiming for, rather than a critical analysis of what might hold you back. We'll keep those for Q&A, because they tend to be rather specific to your organizations, and there's plenty of information out there about how to deal with it. Also, there's only so much we can discuss in one presentation. So as we're discussing, we'll highlight each of those areas, and you might even notice some patterns. So let's first take the organizational stereotype that was the startup. Examples in this space are things like JClarity, Shazam, Abundance, and even GDS with inside of UK government originally. There's not much about these out there because they're either in stealth mode or they're not talking or they're too focused on delivering and getting to the point of becoming the next type of a unicorn than they are to actually start solving these problems at scale, but also they're not encountering as many of the problems, which we'll see. So the first, first point is easier to take as a whole. So we'll take the whole category of people. For example, communication of culture and knowledge sharing is often done informally. There are aren't really needing to be brown bag sessions or anything engineered because that all happens organically. Commonly, the whole company works closely together, often able to see each other over the tables. And Agile, by default, is already there. And they're early adopters of all the new Agile practices. I mean, they have many microservices, uh, but they're often owned by the same team. And teams are made up of cross-discipline people by necessity. With everyone sharing ownership and accountability, everyone is on pager duty. We really are all in this together. In terms of deployment, it's addressed as required. I mean, it's all driven by the services that are being deployed and the needs that come out of that. Testing is mostly developer-led in a behavior-driven form, working closely with the business requirements at hand. Resilience is more of a technical concern of how do I make sure that my microservice scales rather than any other concerns that uh, they might have. But the risks as well are balanced against the target business market requirements. The impact of failure and the negative exposures are really the most concerning. How do I avoid getting bad press? <coughs> Risk is something that can creep up on a startup. So if, you, if you're prepared for the eventualities, watch out. Don't sleepwalk into a register headline. But it gets more interesting as we move to more complex organizations taking the unicorn. I like this image as it's, it depicts the unicorn in its greatest form and describes how the unicorn actually works. Because as we can see, rainbows are made by sunlight passing through a prism and a fiber optic. Examples in this space are Amazon, Google, Facebook, Netflix, Uber, Atlassian, Spotify. We can get, these are the ones that we all name. And these are the ones that we hold up as being the DevOps organizations that should be telling us where to go. But they're not always telling us to go in the right direction. You see, what's right for them might not be right for us. But if you, uh, as a larger monolithic organization, if you take communication of culture and knowledge, that sharing is managed uh, as more formally in these uh, unicorn environments than you would find in a startup. Because let's face it, a 1,000 people in a Slack room doesn't cut it anymore. The company has people you've never met. And you have to navigate the company more by job role and by their function than by knowing Dave over there who does anything to do with engineering. The free selection of methodologies has gone away. And you've now got approved ways of working in the name of consistency. That's not to say you can't do your own thing, but you now have to justify why you're doing something different. Remind me again, why are you building yet another key value store? 
As the complexity of the product grows, so does the size of the implementation. You now have architects that decompose these systems into microservices. There are many teams, each responsible for their own microservices, and that's good. More people means more cross-discipline teams, and with more specialized roles in each, roles are not grouped together anymore, but they do share knowledge amongst their speciality group. For example, Spotify ha um, talk about their culture and how they organize their teams. They have tribes, squads, chapters, and guilds. If you've not read up on uh, Spotify's approach to uh, team structures, it's really well worth a read. I wouldn't take it wholesale, though, as I've seen a few organizations struggle to merge that in with their own culture. And so you have to pragmatically apply this, of course. Ownership. It's a big one. And it's held by teams rather than individuals. And it's shared across the team members, although accountability is held by the individuals championing any particular change. Those accountable being put on pager duty, often the developer that wrote the code, is not a bad approach. There's a traditional operations team still in place, but they do a different type of thing because they're picking up the uh, server, system reliability engineers are picking up the availability and support aspect. Someone still needs to answer those queries, and someone still needs to check the lights are on and manage Nagios and give you, provide you the infrastructure. So having a team to do that is still the ops team, but that doesn't mean you're not still doing DevOps. So don't think that in order to do DevOps, you have to kill every other uh, system administrator that doesn't work in a development team. Scale becomes a big challenge as unicorns grow to millions of users really quickly. I mean, any startup can get web scale with just one BuzzFeed. Uh, it's not that hard to get, but it's, you never know that it's coming. So you have to prepare for it. And these unicorns have dealt with the demands of scale as a first class concern. And so they have performance testing, and they take that testing seriously. If you're building a system and you th your aim is to become a unicorn and you are a startup, make sure you're thinking about what happens if you become a unicorn. It's not just about can I deal with today, but what happens if tomorrow comes sooner than I think it is. With the larger number of users comes other threats that you might not actually notice. Things like a larger store of data is a larger security target. If you've only got 100 users in your system, no one's going to take note. If you've got a million users in your system, and your system is doing tax returns, you're going to have hackers knocking on your door every second. As a wide, a wide geographic distribution of the user base brings a different type of challenge. Understanding what latency is like across continents isn't something that your startup engineer really thought about. But now as engineers inside of a unicorn, we really do need to. And this information in a DevOps well unicorn is going to be thinking about those things too. Those challenges come from all quarters. The impacts of outages also become much higher. People are now relying on you, and uptime has now become king. So the testing regime is much more rigorous. Bugs should be found early and die young. You want to shift left, move all your testing to the left. And that's not a bad principle in terms of the startups, but it's not something that you can usually justify outside of a unicorn, as in terms of the megalith, people are questioning as to why you're wasting time not writing code. And at the bottom, we can't spend time doing anything other than writing code. So we bring up testing later, though. The scale of running components means monitoring systems need to advance to provide information over raw data. And if you look at pushing things out over to Azure or AWS, the management console is fine if you have 20 machines, 20,000, and you're going to have to take different approaches to managing that. And when you start putting monitoring and uh, measurement information there, the scale of the information can just give you pure data. And if all you see is data, you'll miss the problems. You need to get out of the weeds and out of the data into information. And if we scale that even further, we have to take that information across, say, a million machines, which are running across 30 different data centers, which you're now federating across multiple regions and even different vendors. And you have to take that information and turn it into knowledge. You have to look at it from the other angle. You have to look at it to what, as someone who cares about the operation of my system, what are the three questions I want to know? 
Usually the questions are, is it up? If it is, I'm going back to bed. If it's not, is it something that I've seen before? And let's classify that as an amp. But if it's, I've seen it before, I know how to fix it. In fact, if it's something I've seen before, I should tell the system how to fix it and make it a bit more clever. And we have AI and all sorts of frameworks to do that. And make it red if it's not. Is this a new problem? In which case, start a root cause analysis, because you want to move that into amber so we know about it so we can stop this happening again. All of this stuff can creep up on a developer who is, hasn't got operational awareness or operational experience. This guy tells me about it all the time. He just tells me I'm wrong. Data scale is the other thing that you have to worry about, because bigger data means more than just being a bigger target. It means your backups take longer. When you've got a terabyte of data, how, how do you shift this off-site? And there's a difference between backups and resilience and uh, creating mirrors, because if you end up with a problem in your data and you mirror it, you've now got your problem in your backup. So there's concepts like snapshot. All this stuff now matters. At the unicorn level, with the decomposed teams, they're being told to handle and manage it themselves, and we're seeing a rise of the service reliability engineer teams that are helping development teams figure out what this stuff means in providing frameworks. I would put my money on the next couple of years, the integration challenge, and the uh, developers developer support platforms to come out of organizations like Netflix, as that's where they're currently on fire. Finally, disaster re recovery testing is something that you now re uh, exercise on a regular basis. Failing over to new data centers is something you do as usual. It's something you do regularly, not that thing that you have in a manual, like in a large bank that says, we did this sometime in the last six months, and eventually we got 50 people to make it work. And they've all since left. Testing, as I said before. So this is, in a startup, is an exercise of correctness. It's making sure that what you intended to happen, happened. Whereas at this level, you're also, more importantly, checking about protection. Is it not doing something that it shouldn't be doing? Is this component that I put in putting the rest of the system at risk? Is this one thing consuming so much CPU, nothing else is happening? As an exercise of protection, testing becomes more important. The key about this is making uh, 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 the point of correctness you don't need to worry about having representative systems. But your test system, in order to be a proper uh, performance test, or a, a under load, or for it to be a security test, needs to be representative of the sorts of environment it's going to be in in production. Otherwise, you're testing something different. And if you find a problem, it's probably not a problem that you'd have in production. Or at least, if you don't find a problem, it doesn't mean that it's not there. Change control. I, I love can change control the unicorns because they tend to flip. And this is a really strange one because they flip between, in a startup, there is no change control. You commit and we push out onto the website. That's great. Let's just do that. At some point, someone says, hang on, we've got 600 developers, not six. That's probably not a great idea. Let's put some control in this and we'll do reviews. We'll even go as far as a change approval board if you want to go old school. And it sort of flips around different methodologies because they're unique and they can figure it out themselves, right? Until they figure out that what you really need is to be able to fix things fast. You need to be able to get to value as quickly as possible. And you want to then be able to move quickly with the minimum amount of risk of doing so. So they institute the idea of change as business as usual. By default, we say yes and we move forward. All of our systems should accept that change is going to happen. How do we protect ourselves from change uh, doing harm? Rather than, if we change nothing, then nothing will be harmed. It's how do we make sure that we can safely change something and progress? Because if you're standing still, you're falling behind because everyone else is running. This all leads nicely into risk. As risk has become a first class concern. But by embracing change as business usually, uh, sorry, is embracing business as usual changes, this is applied pragmatically, but also reactively. So you might have noticed the areas highlighted were jumping around somewhat. They uh, jumped a lot more around than they did for the startup, but they were roughly in the same order. We'll see how this applies to the megalith. 
This is our final stereotype. I mean, they want to desperately be cool and still relevant in this world, uh, but they're not quite a unicorn as much as they try. I mean, examples in this space are the obvious ones you'll think of. IBM, Oracle, government, uh, Apple, financial institutions, military. You get the idea. The communication channels in here and the culture of we're all in this together has actually been cultivated in a lot of these organizations now. Um, I, you can take some of those examples, and they really want to change. They know that they need to change, and they're all well, willing to do so. But we have to be careful, because the goal is not to change the company culture overtly. But we need to demonstrate how a different culture could benefit everyone. Positive DevOps rhetoric from the executive and senior leaderships in these organizations is enabling the grassroots to pragmatically apply the DevOps principles. I mean, that support isn't critically needed, but it is so useful if it's there, only to give you a mandate. In some organizations, we've seen it not work so well as uh, they've stood up and told you, here's how you do it. But what you really want is, I will support you in doing what you need to, in order to revolutionize and evolve your part of the organization. I won't say much more about things that are going wrong, because I'll run out of time and bore him. Anyway, don't laugh. I told you this could be applied in... I, I told you this is how it could be applied in a supportive environment, because any time you drift outside of that, we do get into the weeds and we get a bit stuck. But if you have any challenges, come up to us and talk afterwards. Uh, we've, we've seen enough horrors to try and recommend this sort of approach. So the improvements to process through lean and uh, to deployment through automation have been established in a lot of these organizations. Continuous integration has taken hold in most that we've uh, seen, for example. Although the constraints exist with externalities, uh, such as sign-off and external testing teams, they're not going away anytime soon. You're not going to find that you, your testing team is insourced or that you're able to have all of your de developers locally. So you have to deal with that as, and accept that as that's it. But it doesn't mean you can't follow the DevOps principles. Microservices don't seem that micro. However, the principle of clear purpose and defined interactions can still be achieved. Um, presenting APIs and clear documentation and intent, you can get away with doing all of that stuff, even if you don't have support outside of your unit. Teams are built around the principles of mastery, autonomy, and purpose. If you have a regional director or if you have a set of teams and you can follow those principles, that's really, really useful. If you Google for high-performing teams, it's mastery, autonomy, and purpose they're all talking about. And it's a really good topic to dig into. But while cross-discipline teams may exist within the scope of the organization unit, most roles continue to follow a team structure, which is discipline aligned. You'll still have all your DBAs together, you'll have all your testers together, you'll have your system engineers together, for example. And emphasizing the importance of integration of common objectives and communication between teams is what I really want to say. As if your teams are not aligned, as I said before, you end up with different objectives trying to be reached, and we're not, if we're not pulling in the same direction, we'll never get as far as we can if we were. Ownership and accountability is clearly allocated and defined by the teams. Operation teams continue to run out of network centers with heavier support from the entire product team than previously experienced. And rather than the objective of getting every commit uh, into production, we've now got a focus on smoothing the release pipeline so that changes can be rolled out with the minimum manual intervention and failures caught early. But dealing with the challenges of scale is second nature, as is with any large organization. But the risk-averse nature of change is what was the lead weight. That being removed, but still keeping that uptime remains king, and the shift in mentality from change by exception due to change as business as usual, having that prevail means that it's your operational view drives you in the right direction. Development, in order to assist with operational awareness issues that come up with taking ownership of deployment processes, is now involved. And we've got cross-accountability between the teams. 
and as much as it's wonderful to think that we could put the developer that wrote that line of code on call, that's not practical in an organization that it fits of a megalithic type. So development instead support operations through programmatic practice, best practices of things like codifying systems. Developers can hope, help with uh, um, how do we put uh, our system configuration under source control, as we've got a lot more experience with doing that. We can help with practices around composability and modules and let's <laughs> dry. This is it's something as simple as the dry principle of don't repeat yourself is uh, something that we can help with inside of a traditional operation system. But Overcoming the disparity in environments and the computational constraints is a tough challenge and still faces many people. But as we mentioned before, with performance testing, having a different system which you're developing against and a different system that you're pushing into production can really hurt you. So as uh, Henry laughed at me and said he's seen our development machines, we'll have operations come and help us build more reliable, more consistent environments and be more symp uh, sympathetic to those environments we're going into. If nothing else, that helps draw them into our world. The solution is mainly credited to virtualization associated tooling. However, not everyone can go virtual, at least not yet. The team boundaries are still visible and have led to the creation of micro teams. Think microservices, but micro teams. As an organization type that has commonly grown through our acquisitions, these large organizations uh, have teams that are inside and out that are often still strongly demarked. I mean, cost savings drive outsourcing and the contractual uh, communication challenges that creates a concern that needs to close management. And this close management of understanding how people are wired and how people are joined up, if when, again, not, if we've got competing aims and objectives, we're not going to get to the right solution especially if we find out that an organization that shall remain nameless has made their development team get paid for fixing bugs, which kind of encourages bugs to be there in the first place. Those sorts of things are really subtle and come out of the woodwork. Well, if you have a look at this um, highlighting, you might have noticed that the areas are much more erratic. While we follow the same path and the same principles, it's been far more involved and also, the coloring has been far more fragmented. And what we need to try and do as a large enterprise working towards DevOps is you're taking something established and you're trying to improve it and you're trying to work backwards. Whereas the unicorn and the startup have had the ability to start along the right path and they don't have the same sort of baggage. To coin a term, what we effectively need to do is defrag these organizations of how the culture is split and fractured amongst the organization and pull people together. So, if you only remember these things. Well, think DevOps, think Calm. This is the, the first thing. Um, Calm has got a strong movement around it and watch how that's going to drive forward. Also, Calm as a whole is a worthwhile um, anagram that's worth remembering and repeating. Just think, is what you're trying to achieve fitting within these pillars? Automation is useful, and that's great. Use Puppet, use Chef, Salt Ansible. Do deploy it out into your passes and do use uh, AWS and Azure. But remember, that's only a means to an end. And the culture change is really what's key inside the organization. And you need to have a look and focus on that, otherwise everything else becomes uh, refactoring rather than resolution. Avoid the hype. We showed you some comical examples of how DevOps is portrayed, and they do overlap. If you were to put them on a Venn diagram, it wouldn't look like we're insane, but they would sh certainly show that we don't have any agreement around what we're trying to achieve with DevOps. It's like saying that we're trying to achieve XML. The key thing about it is be pragmatic in this application. So when you're taking all of these principles and you're pulling it in and you're trying to apply them, make sure that you're being rational and reasonable 
and then pragmatic in your expectation. And finally, and possibly most importantly, be empathetic, because it's not about you. It's about how you use your skills as a developer and can be of use to the wider team. This includes supporting others so they can understand the development mindset and also how you can help the business drive forward. If you're not being empathetic, then you're not going to be understanding what you're trying to achieve. And with that, I'll invite questions. In that case, thank you. Thank you.